Most of the television programs in this course deal with our outstanding works of architectural design that came into being during the period 1890 to 1939. This program is an exception in that it deals with design as an activity, and I want to discuss the creative processes involved in architecture by explaining how I designed my own house near Newcastle on Tyne. But there's another reason for showing you this house. It was completed 30 years after our period. And it does, I think, show how architects' ideas have been completely revolutionised by developments in design techniques which took place between 1890 and 1939. To begin with, I'd like to explain the process of architectural creativity as I see it. And here a personal view is inevitable because design is a very personal kind of activity. For simplicity's sake, I'd like to separate the activity of design from the information being fed in about any problem. So I'll begin by talking about how we absorb and sort out the information we have. The kind of information we draw on seems to range from one's past experience of architecture in general, which I'd call an indirect source, to the information supplied in the brief, about the accommodation required, the context, and so on, which I'd place much nearer to the centre of operations information of direct importance to the job. Outside this area I'd place the work of architects one admires, and between them I would place the ideas which begin to form as part of the investigation process. In my experience these images are very important and direct one's search towards a solution very strongly. In the units I've mentioned that I wanted a vernacular cottage kind of expression as in this Northumberland group. And also, I wanted a sense of 20th century dynamism, two images which seemed to be in conflict. Whilst these basic images were always at the back of my mind, they were supported by more specific images which made a deep impression on me at the time, and I warmed to them for different reasons. One was the Sea Ranch development in California, which I'd seen illustrated. I liked it because it had some dynamic spaces which suggested freedom and informality. Another was Corbusier's Jao houses, which I'd recently visited. This was Corbusier at his most sophisticated, with a marvellously economical use of shapes and materials and the sense of grandeur that's always present in his work. Then there was Tom Mellor's cottage-type house near Blackpool, Ribby Wood. I liked it because it fitted into its context so well, with beautiful proportions, careful use of traditional materials, resulting in a very English kind of imagery. And another was an interior as depicted in, in a film, the Pink Panther. This was supposed to be a modern chalet in Switzerland and it was inhabited by a girlfriend of David Niven. It had a rather splendid living space with a sunken conversation area and a large fireplace with logs burning. So those are the pieces of information and in order to make use of them a certain technique has to be learned. Like any technique it develops out of direct experience and knowledge of the work of others. I want to mention two aspects of technique which apply to the actual process of design. One is the way there's a constant switching from the whole to the parts, or in my case mainly from the parts to the whole. For example, one of my basic notions was that I wanted certain activities to be possible in my living area. Let me draw them for you. 
First, I wanted to be able to sit around the fire. And secondly, I wanted to be able to sit around the television at the same time. Thirdly, I wanted to be able to enjoy stereo. And fourthly, I wanted to be able to enjoy a view whilst doing all these things. In addition, I, I wanted a feeling of intimacy and privacy with an extension of my view to something beyond the living space, rather like this. In other words, I didn't want a particularly large living area as such, but I wanted to be conscious of it extending to something beyond, an idea which derived directly from the Maison's jowl. And this idea of a very specific kind of living space based on some pretty definite views which I had was much firmer than anything else in the design, although I was almost as definite about more general requirements. For instance, I knew I wanted at least three bedrooms and a close relationship between the kitchen and the living area and the dining area. However, the point I want to make is that one constantly ranges from particular ideas to the general and back again, constantly modifying each of them. The parts you're reasonably sure about can be juggled until everything slots into place. Now, this juggling process, the arrangement of the various knowns, brings me to the second thing that seems to happen with design. I'm always looking for combinations which provide the maximum opportunity. Experience tells me the kind of arrangements that are likely to pay off, and those which are likely not to. The standard house, of which mine was a modification, was limited. It is, of course, a fairly common kind of formula, a modern equivalent of the Georgian house. It satisfies most people's needs extremely well. If we compare it with Le Corbusier's Houses for Workers of 1924, where he breaks a single cube down in a way which allows contrasting spaces and where opportunity is created for the eye to dwell on forms and to enjoy walking up a stair, of course, you're right to say how impracticable. These houses were never built. But they do highlight the difference between Le Corbusier's approach with its concentration on visual stimuli and the traditional attitude which aimed at privacy and enclosure. But the main difference is that to Le Corbusier a house was high art, which for him meant a heightened awareness of space and shapes, whereas for most people a house is a container for living which provides a very different kind of visual pleasure. Still on this question of technique, the way architectural elements are assembled. I was so intrigued by Le Corbusier's approach to design that I spent four years examining his work. And amongst the many lessons that I learnt from this were two very important points of technique. For instance, this is the Monastery of La Tourette. And this shows us, I think, that light can be as positive an element of architecture as the various shapes. Because if a wall or a space is carefully illuminated, it can be completely transformed. This is another building where this happens, the Villa Savoie. And we'll be looking at this later in the course. Secondly, I learnt that a circulation route can form the basis of a plan, and that movement in such a building is enhanced by varied experiences on the route. Let us return to the specific information in the brief, which is perhaps closest to the design activity. Let me remind you of some basic facts. That my lack of money caused me to modify a basic house type that was already being built that I was restricted to a rectangle of about the same dimensions as the standard type, about 1,600 square feet overall, excluding the garage. I had to use the same materials as those in the standard house, including the type and colour of brick, and I had to use windows from a standard range. What I was doing was to reassemble an existing kit of parts. This was the context, a farm on the brow of a hill, a shallow valley containing a small river. 
The river, the farm and the site with its approach roads. Country on one side, thinly spread housing on the other. The river, as is often the case, is the divider. And although it's only small, it combines with the farm to pr provide a rural force. This was my first sketch, and it's a very modest design, I think you'll agree. I think I was inhibited by the need to modify an existing type. It has the traditional pitched roof, and it's more an outline layout of accommodation possibilities than anything, done to show me what I could get in terms of actual rooms within the given area. And yet, as often happens, Curiously, it contains the essential arrangement of the final design, which I think I can explain best if I sketch it. Establishing the rectangle, we enter here, and we have the living space with a wall wrapping around here and the library in this part. The circulation route goes along here, and we're able to move through with a low wall here, and we can see across this low wall into the living space. And we go along and we descend into it by two steps. The fireplace was here, and we have this ledge which goes all the way around, a window here in the library, and another one here. The circulation route continues in this direction, so that we have a dining space here, and we have a kitchen here. We have a serving hatch joining the two, and here we have a bathroom and three bedrooms completing the design. And in this arrangement, which has this traditional pitched roof with the low ceiling, we have a hint of horizontal spatial linkage, but of course we don't have any vertical spaces. And we have the bedrooms as cell-like containers with the living spaces rather different. Now, there's a sort of circulation route along which there are some incidents, but nothing like what I really wanted. So I tried another arrangement which extended the circulation route, and I also had a series of flat roof designs which were all the time exploring the possibility of space around the central fireplace which was something that is beginning to happen in this design. And this was an idea that had taken root and which I hung on to because I believed in it. As part of my explorations, I turned this design round so that we have the living space at this end with the library here. And having extended the circulation route so that we now come in here, we have a kitchen, dining, study, bathroom, small bedroom, and two larger bedrooms completing the design. This began the kind of chain reaction that I was looking for because I next tried a double pitched roof so that instead of this arrangement we have two pitches, the smaller one over the front part of the design, the larger one over the rear, and down the center the circulation route I was able to define this by the insertion of the studio attic, which I think I can best show you on the model. And here we can see the two roof pitches, which if I remove them will reveal the circulation spine. We've got the possibility of a whole series of contrasts between the two roofs and the horizontal low roof of the circulation zone. And this double pitch helped to clarify the plan arrangement by separating the front and the back parts of the design. I pulled the front to one side so that it helped to separate the two forms to clarify them. And I wrapped the garage round at the end so that the house would be a satisfactory termination to its cul-de-sac situation. The double roof pitch allowed sun penetration right into the heart of the house and this gave a marvellous opportunity to light the central part of the circulation zone by admitting light through here, down through the funnel. And access is given by a ladder from the hall through to the attic above. 
and light also enters the living area in the same way through a clear story into the living zone. The model shows us the definition of the circulation route and the incidence along it so that as we come in here we've got first of all the light coming down through this hole we can see up immediately into the roof. We move along and there's a squeezing in and before we come to the spaces which are the kitchen on one side and the dining space on the other and as we move along we are then stopped by the fireplace which uh, makes us turn, we have to turn left and we go through this tunnel into the library space from which we can see into the living space which is the climax of the whole movement sequence. I'd describe this arrangement around the fireplace as a pinwheel because the spaces are all revolving around the fireplace, the dining, the kitchen, the library and the living space. And this is another technique that had been used extensively by both Le Corbusier and Frank Lloyd Wright. And in many of Wright's designs, the fireplace is thought of as it is here, as the symbolic heart of the house, as the nucleus. Not only do spaces revolve around it, but the low walls slot into it, and so does the studio. As we drive up to the house, we see how these ideas worked out in the building itself. The vernacular cottage theme seemed to me to ask for no large windows on this front and another factor is that uh, it's south facing. And here we can see how the garage is wrapped round to terminate this view. These clear story windows increase the sense of stretching and further the linear idea. This part of the design stops here and this bedroom window marks the fact. I was using standard windows and this almost square bathroom window has a neutral role in the composition. The kitchen window is long and gives a good view out and takes up the general linear theme of the composition. This window is deeper than the others because it's special. It's part of the library and the shape fits between bookshelves rather well and gives a good view out from a sitting position. The doorway is an incision into the form because I wanted to take the circulation funnel idea outside. I wanted the entrance to give a feeling of penetration so that we don't just go through a door but we have a transitional situation that's part inside and part outside. On entry we get a glimpse of something beyond, but nearer and to the right is the ladder that leads up through the funnel or light well to the attic. It's a natural thing to move along an axis and we are squeezed in by the walls immediately before seeing the kitchen to the left and the dining space to the right. The kitchen fittings are hung from the walls and they're in timber. The visual warmth of wooden surfaces plays a very important part in the design of the whole house. We have a glimpse of the library but we're squeezed in again before we move into it. And now we can see the living area from the dining zone in a sort of frame. As the climax of the movement sequence, this living space is suitably grand. It's larger and more formal than the other spaces, though in the same key.
the fact that we walk down into it increases the sense of importance. And the continuous tiled ledge helps to tie the various parts together rather in the way that panelling used to in previous ages. The rich red of these quarry tiles works with the timber. Le Corbusier called these friendly materials and they're very much part of the vernacular imagery which is a basic design idea. There are three main things happening in the design here. There are the horizontal parts, the floors, the low ceiling of the circulation route, the ledge, the low walls. Then there are the vertical elements such as the walls, the chimney. and the two roof pitches which are at different heights with one large beam holding up the roof of the living area. I wanted all these things, verticals, obliques and horizontals, to come together in a kind of crescendo around the fireplace. Space is allowed to flow continuously not only around the fireplace nucleus but through to the studio space and back again. The tall library window is a vertical element which admits western sun discreetly in a way that doesn't disturb anyone sitting in the living area. And it seemed important to keep these timbers vertical to echo the vertical form of the chimney alongside. In the studio we have an intimate space that's quite different from the open spaces of the living zone. It adds flexibility to the house and we use it for a variety of purposes. And here, as elsewhere in the building, I use the friendly texture of wood to create an atmosphere of warmth and intimacy. I wanted the house to provide viewing opportunities and privacy to requirements which needn't be in conflict. And I think the living area demonstrates this. The rear of the house is sheltered from the prevailing wind and has a good view. The process I've described to you has been deliberately simplified. But two things I hope emerge clearly. One is how much architects of my generation owed to Le Corbusier and to the techniques of spatial organization which he and others introduced during the period which you are about to study. The second is the way my thinking was affected by buildings I'd admired. These are the jowl houses which caused me to reject the conventional approach to house design. Sea Ranch again. And during the period you're about to study, a new approach to architecture came into being. It emerged in a remarkably short period of time. Between 1890 and 1930, a relatively small number of gifted individuals, Frank Lloyd Wright and Le Corbusier are two, completely revolutionized architecture and in the process turned it almost literally.